Gabriela Mascarre, and together with my colleague Naomi, um, we are orchestrating the community of practices, practice, sorry, for the Healthy Communities Initiative. As some of you may already know, this community of practice aims to basically help projects that are working in the space of placemaking and are working on the space of community building so that they can thrive and they can build meaningful relationships among them. We are very excited today to be hosting this conversation that will basically explore the intersections, the connections and relationships between the digital space and also the physical space. And as actually as a way to warm up this virtual room in which we are all together, it would be great if you could share your name and where are you joining us from on the Zoom chat so that we can get a sense of who is um, in the room today. Just before we start, I want to share with you a couple of technical reminders. So the first thing is to let you know that this is a webinar. Therefore, we, um, we cannot see or we cannot hear you. So if you have any concern, any problems with the technology, or you have any questions, please make sure that you pop them on the Zoom chat so that we can follow up and support you. The second thing that we want to make sure that you know is that this session is available in both English and French. So if you want to access the French interpretation, you can click on the globe that you find at the bottom of your screen. Once you click there, you will see that you have the option to set the session either in French or in English. And finally, we want to make sure that you know that we want to make these sessions as interactive as possible. And with this purpose, we have prepared what we call a collaborative document. Basically, it's an open document where all of you can contribute during the session. And the purpose of this document is basically to make sure that everything, the conversation is well documented and that you can all also share basically information about your projects and your questions, your background, et cetera, so that we can follow up not only during the session, but also after the session on everything that has been said or that has been exchanged in this virtual room that hosts us all together. Before we start, um, we want to acknowledge that today we are hosting to the session from Toronto, which is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. And that this territory is the home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Metis people. I also want to acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13, signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit, and the Williams Treaty, signed with multiple Mississaugas and Chippewa bands. So after opening a little bit the room and initiating the session, I think the only thing that is left to say is what is all this session about? Why are we all together here today? So basically, today's session aims to basically offer an overview of, of different open, equitable, and accessible digital resources, while also helping you think and um, strategize about how to think uh, about digital tools and how these digital tools can actually contribute to your ongoing activities. Today's session will be guided by Katie Gibson from the Canadian Center for Nonprofit Digital Resilience, and also by Tristan Penn from N10. But um, you will find both their bios and also the links to their websites and, and their organizations in the shared document that has popped up in the Zoom chat. We are very happy because together with Katie and with Christian, we also have two projects that have been funded by the Healthy Communities Initiative, who will be sharing their experiences, their learnings, and many of their thoughts on, on, on everything that they are doing. On the one hand, we have Sharon Switzer and Maggie Grayson from the Near North Mobile Media Lab. And they will be talking about a bit, um, sorry, sharing with us a bit their experiences working with youth and digital media in Northern Ontario. And then on the other hand, we also have the team of the Indigenous Friendship Association. We have got Alejandro Mayoral, Alina Rizvi, and Mackenzie Toulouse. And they will be sharing their learnings, their to-dos and not to-dos when you're trying to design and co-design technologies with local communities that are culturally relevant. So I think this is everything from our side. We're very happy to be hosting this conversation today. Um, so now I think over to you, Katie. Super. Um, well, thank you so much. Really delighted to have a chance to speak with all of you today. 
Um, as Gabriela mentioned, I'm uh, one of the co-founders of the Canadian Centre for Nonprofit Digital Resilience, um, which launched just at the end of March. Um, and the other co-founders are N10, um, hi Tristan, um, Imagine Canada, Setsi, and Tamarack Institute. Um, so why digital resilience and why now? Um, you know, I'm assuming that like me, you all are passionate about uh, the nonprofit sector. Um, and this is a conversation really with a 20-year time horizon. So we're, we're thinking about, you know, what do we see as the future of the nonprofit sector and of the, the social change and social justice work that we're all trying to do? Um, and how are we going to meet the challenges we face today um, and create the, the kind of future that we want to see. Um, so before passing the baton to Tristan, I'll, I'll share a few thoughts that, um, a few of the thoughts that led us to establish the Canadian Centre for Nonprofit Digital Resilience. Um, first, no news to anybody, the world is increasingly digital. 65% um, of the world's GDP is set to be digitalized by, by the end of this year. Um, so this really isn't a need or a conversation that's specific to our sector. Um, this is about our sector, you know, solving 21st century problems with 21st century tools. Um, and we know that, you know, the end game is nonprofits, um, when they use technology skillfully um, and have, you know, strong digital leadership, strong capacity, it can really be uh, an impact multiplier. Um, and technology can help foster, you know, better services, better relationships with with clients and beneficiaries and communities and, and donors and all, all of the, the stakeholders. Um, and, you know, better data leads to, to better outcomes. Um, but we also see, you know, the data tells us that nonprofits aren't adopting technology at pace or at scale. Um, and there was a great Canada Help survey last year um, that went into some of, some of these details and I'd recommend taking a look at that. Um, but one, you know, one stat that really stood out to me is that only a quarter of the organization surveyed rated their knowledge and skill level as very good um, for general office operational software. Um, so we're not talking about you know <laughs> fancy tools. This is it, this is sort of the basic um, stuff. Another trend is is there is this massive transformation of the global labor market underway. Um, digital skills are going to be required in almost every job, um, and frankly, we can't leave the nonprofit sector's labor force behind. Um, so we really believe this is this is no longer an organizational challenge. This is really a sector imperative. Um, and the Canadian Center for Nonprofit Digital Resilience is, is here to meet that challenge as, as a sector and together as a sector. Um, so I'd say, you know, feel free to check out the website for, for all the details. We'll put the link in the chat. Um, please join us. This is very much a sector initiative. So please sign on as an advisor join our mailing list. If you follow us on LinkedIn, you'll get all of the updates. Um, our primary role is really is as a convener. Um, so we're launching three wor working groups in the coming weeks, um, one focused on building cybersecurity in the sector, one focused on building um, sector motivation and urgency for digital transformation, um, and a third um, looking at you know, how, how we cultivate sort of digital literacy and skills among nonprofit staff. Um, we're also partnering on an event with Three to Health Foundation for funders um, to help them think through how they can better support the technology needs of grantees, um, which we know is a really important piece of the puzzle. Um, so really, you know, please, please join us and I'm happy to answer any other questions um, about that. But now, you know, with, with that brief introduction to, to sort of how we're thinking about this, love to pass it over to Tristan, who, who's going to talk um, more specifically about some of the, the tech uh, tools and, and approaches and mindsets out there. Great, thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate being here. Um, you know, as, as we did introductions before, my name is Tristan Penn. I am calling in from, uh, let me just turn this into a slideshow. Perfect. Um, I'm calling in from Portland, Oregon, um, and I am the Senior Manager of Equity and Accountability at N10. Um, and I am super excited to be here uh, to talk about selecting the right tool for your work. And I think as Katie was um, really just like hitting the point home um, with this was um, this idea that, you know, there's, there's a gap. There's a gap that exists with nonprofits and just any sort of charity work. And what are the technology pieces that we need um, as folks who are working in nonprofit? Um, and what are, you know, what are the other tools that can help assist us with our work and make it not harder, but more efficient and also just more um, 
more flexible to uh, your lives too. I think uh, one thing that we've all learned um, this last these last two years, I don't know. Time is an accordion, and I don't <laughs> understand what <laughs> what time has been um, the last couple of years. I'm sure you all can relate as well too. So like things that were last week feel like years ago, and things years ago feel like last week. So. Um, that's just what the pandemic has done to me. And I think that's something that should also be accounted for in how we look at technology currently in this current time and also future thinking, right? So future thinking in um, planning for your own personal work, wherever you're working at, whether it's a consultancy, whether you are a someone who is um, uh, working for yourself or you're working for an organization, how can you fold in technology pieces um, for your own work to make it more efficient? But also how can you advocate for equitable and accessible um, pieces of technology in your workspace with the folks that you're in collaboration with, right? Um, so that's that's really um, where, where we're all, you know, where I am coming from too. And um, contrary to popular belief, I came on to N10. I was I was very reticent to. I, I come from a background of uh, youth development. I am. I I worked for about thirteen years in uh, youth development in nonprofit, and so all, a lot of my skill set is in um, you know like programming and operations and administration for those types of programs. And coming over to N10 a technology nonprofit, I, I told them straight up, you know, I'm I'm not a whiz with any of these things. You are a technology organization and I, um, I'm i not someone who identifies as someone that's good at technology too. And they, they told me, you know, that's not who we're looking for too. And also that's not who we are as an organization. We start with people and um, what they can provide to the organization. And we don't have as a requirement um, the, uh, you know, a skill set for a specific uh, CRM or a skill set for a specific, um, you know, tool that we're using or a technology tool. And so that was something that really was alluring to me too, because I had never worked in a setting where there weren't requirements. And, you know, you're, it's required to work that you need to be uh, proficient in, uh, Microsoft Office. It's required that you need to be proficient in uh, Salesforce. None of that apply, ha had happened at N10 too. And so that was really nice and also just a really great place to be at. So enough about like, you know, all that preamble to say um, that, you know, when we're selecting tools, um, a big thing uh, with selecting tools is making sure that you are centering the people in the situation and not to deviate from um, those, 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 uh, guideposts. When you start to center people and the communities that you are working with, you are always going to make the correct decision too. So, um, that's just what I'll say. And then a, a few things about N10. Here is our mission. Um, here is our vision too. And, uh, that's, that's our goal. That's, it's one of those things where we're, we're like kind of an odd nonprofit in that we don't, um, have like a direct service role. Like when I worked in boys and girls clubs, there were like kids were coming through the front door. We had to do like, you know, give them lunch and do all of those great things. We don't have that like direct service component piece. We work with other nonprofits and folks who are working in non in or around or adjacent to nonprofits to make sure that they're getting equitable and ac um, accessible resources, um, trainings, professional development for their own technology technological growth. Um, so that's that's really our corner, and we really enjoy doing it, and it's provided us with a lot of perspective and a lot of um, experience working across the country and around the world with folks who are doing the same type of work. Um, so, again, I want to underscore and also emphasize um, when you are making a decision that centers technology or that, like, is about technology, I encourage you, I highly encourage you to plan before you make that decision. And I know that a lot of you all will say, yes, of course we plan too, but make sure you couple that planning with the, um, the idea that you have to center the folks who are in your process, the folks who are most impacted by your process up and down the organizational ladder. So if it's C-suite folks and it hits every C-suite folks, as well as like those direct service folks, 
you need to include them in on the process. You can't just consider them and dream up what they might, how they might react to this new tool. You have to actually include them in on this decision-making process. And I really want to, um, if you all leave with nothing else here, um, I think the biggest technological planning piece you could say, or you could use walking away from this is include every single person that is impacted uh, with this decision or project along the way, not at the end, but along the way. So you get their feedback in real time. Um, so yes, really plan. <laughs> it's great. It's wonderful. I was not a good planner. I was not a good planner in my early years. And I've really come to like flex that muscle um, a bit more. And it's been really beneficial for me. So um, with all of that to say is we're going to cover some very basic tools here, but I really want you all to sit with how are you planning for bringing on any sort of technological tool? How are you planning? Um, what are your decision-making processes like? And how are you centering the people in your process? That is a must. In order to make your technological decisions um, the most dynamic and the most beneficial for you and your mission, you have to center the people. So let's talk a little bit about communication too. How do you all communicate um, in, in your day-to-day uh, -day work lives too? How are you all communicating? So we have some very um, big buckets that we could like all dip into um, when we're communicating throughout work too. And I really want to um, uh, invite you all to, to think about how you're communicating at work. What are the standards that happen at work? What are the understood things that are occurring at work too? For example, at N10, we use Slack. Slack I, I check my email maybe like twice a week. Um, I know that's like kind of a, sh a shocking and jarring like <laughs> thing for some folks because a lot of folks start their day with email. Email gives me a lot of like anxiety. And so I've started to craft um, two solid days where I dedicate time to answering emails and getting things done and getting back to people and setting expectations with, with folks to ensure that they know that like, they're not going to get an immediate response from me via email. That's not how how that works. That's not how our our um, our like culture works here too. And so I know that's a big thing. And not everyone's culture is intense culture. And I'm not professing or asserting that that is the thing. But I will say that you can make little tweaks with your communication tools to start to set very intentional boundaries for you and yourself. And I I think some of you all are are um, probably dancing around the uh, this this feeling and this thought that like, gosh, the last two years, I feel like I've just kind of been languishing and like, you know, drifting around like um, in this weird uh, liminal space that we are in um, where, you know, you're just kind of like, oh, I got an email. I guess I'll answer it now. Oh, cool. I guess I'll wander around my apartment for a couple, you know, minutes and then, you know, I'll get a drink of water and then I'll answer another email too. Um, and so what I would say is that I, I think you all, um, and I encourage you all to uh, start to make those little pieces and little boundaries that you have set for yourself around how you communicate. The tool is irrelevant to start making those intentional steps to create boundaries and also to um, use those pieces of technology in a way where it doesn't elicit any sort of like fright, but elicits a sort of like, determination and like, oh, cool, I've got this time set aside on Tuesday to look at emails and get things done and send things out. And if you need to schedule those things, schedule them. So the things that we use for communication are, you know, any sort of external communication that we have at N10 is um, with the, the G Suite. Um, so, uh, we use G Suite for a variety of things too. We, we use, uh, Gmail to, you know, communicate with community members across, you know, our membership. Um, and we also use that for, you know, any sort of partnerships that we have, i.e. Katie and myself, um, have been communicating via email too. And so I, um, I understand that you all are probably like, yeah, okay, we get it. Like it's email. It's not that hard too, but I also want to say, um, part of, when you uh, look at technology and when you um, consider technology is that there is an assumption that everyone knows how to use 
um, the Microsoft uh, Teams or uh, the, the Google G Suite or Slack. And that is not the case. So a big thing when, when I was talking about before, when you're centering people is not assuming technological expertise. So when you're working with folks, um, being very clear and very plain with how you speak and how you communicate when you're speaking about tools and also providing elaboration or extrapolation if you need to do so. Um, so um, those are the communication pieces too. And I will say a, a thing about Slack as well too. That's like our internal communication pieces um, and how, we, how, we, how I communicate with any of my colleagues. Um, I have 15 coworkers and they're all around um, across the country. Um, one's, I, we just onboarded a new person, which I'm really excited about. They're in Hawaii. And so that is three hours um, behind West Coast. And then I also have our communications director who's in Brooklyn, New York too. So like <laughs> when Thomas gets up in Brooklyn, Share is not even, it's in the middle of the night for them. And so um, it, it's been a, a bit of a logistical uh, jump rope game, um, but we've been, we've been able to make it work too. And I will say that with Slack, it's been really beneficial to when I am sending a message to, to Thomas, it'll tell me, hey, this is outside of Thomas's working hours. Are you sure you wanna send this message too? You have these really great nuggets of, um, prompts that some of these tools provide where you're able to um, to uh, really be mindful, again, of the people too. I think you all are probably gathering that like my corner is like people, people, people. The tools will come later. Figure out who your people are and then you'll get the tools that work best for you. So um, there's the communication piece. Um, I think the, the one thing that may be helpful for you all and the thing that um, um, as I'm as I'm really excited to, to hear more about projects that are happening too. Um, and that's project management too. So I'm very excited to, to talk about this piece too. And there are a lot of really great um, project management tools out there too. I am one of those folks who, uh, I'm a reformed procrastinator. And so I, um, I definitely, uh, have have really had to put in some very hard work um, to understand how um, I need to show up. Yes, deadline achieving. <laughs> I see it in the in the chat too. Thank you so much, Glenda. Um, and it's been it's been a labor of love, but I've absolutely enjoyed the person who I am today, um, and how I'm able to manage projects a bit more. And I will say, part of that is the project manage management tool that we use at N10. Again. We're not, I'm not advocating to use whatever works for you. This is what N10 found to be the most successful with our group of people. It may have been a different project management tool had there been a different mix of folks. Um, so we use Asana and um, I won't go through a screen share of it too, but it really helps to hold a project um, accountable and and create timelines, tasks for each project, um, create subtasks for each um, for each project, and also assigning people things, giving them deadlines, um, giving them a note section or any sort of attachment that you can um, that you want to attach for context for any of those those tasks too. Those are really great tools, um, and I think one thing I I, I think why we used um, Asana and went with Asana was when we were making that decision making process, we were going through it to figure out which project management tool are we going to use? Um, a lot of it was like, okay, Tristan, how, how do you learn? How do you receive information best? And I think that's really what, what, what the questions that you all should be asking for of yourself, not only of yourself, but also the teammates that you're going to be in collaboration with. So what? how do they receive information if, Linear timelines are not a way, uh, a thing that like folks can wrap their minds around, or that's not a, a thing for them to like 
really receive that information. The good thing is Asana has like a visual board as well too, which has like um, things that it, it's drawn out in a way that makes sense for those visual folks too. Um, and, you know, there's also just like the list option too as well, which is really great for, um, I'm a visual person. I need to draw things out. Um, I have a coworker who is like very, data driven, I need a list, I need it all in words, I don't know why you're drawing this. Um, this makes absolutely no sense too. And it works for both of us. We're able to interface in, with the same tool through different entry points. And that's really the beauty of when you have a people-centered um, decision-making process for software, you're able to find a tool that works for you and as opposed to finding a tool and trying to shove it down people's throats or like make it to where, oh, I don't even know if this is going to work for me. I wasn't included on this process. So ensuring that you, you're including those folks along the way is really, really important. Um, just some other tools that I, I didn't really have like a good name for a bucket for this, so other tools, um, but things that have helped me to um, spe specifically for me has been, um, I can't say enough about like the Calendly link. Um, I don't know if you all are familiar with it, but it is something that I had kind of stayed away from for a very long time just because of ignorance. I didn't really know what it was supposed to be doing. Um, but I, because I'm a reformed procrastinator, I will kick around emails and do the batting back and forth of like, does Saturday feel good for you? When are you available Sunday? And then they send an email back and say, sorry, I'm not available Sunday. How about Monday? And then that just goes back and forth. And um, that was just, I, I, it was very, it was, it was a struggle for me to keep up with that chain. So what I ended up doing was um, Calendly links to your calendar and it creates a link um, that folks can hop into your calendar and schedule time. Wherever there's a gap, there is a time for them to, to meet with you. So um, that's been a huge savior um, for me in how I collaborate with external folks. Um, I think also there, the big one is Salesforce. Like Salesforce, I, I'm not even going to get into it, but like also that is another tool that can be used. And I will say about Salesforce is um, it is a tool that is so vast and um, deep um, that one, and again, it kind of goes back to what I was saying before of, you know, requiring um, proficiency in Salesforce is kind of not a good way to, if you're looking, if you're putting a job posting out, um, you don't want to require Salesforce as a, um, as a tech requirement too, because the way N10 uses Salesforce is vastly different than how Katie's organization would use Salesforce or any other organization would use Salesforce. So understanding that like there are tools out there that are so custom to each client that it's pointless to include that as a requirement in like a job posting too. And so that's that creates a very, and as a side thing, that's another project I'm working on, That's that creates an equitable onboarding and hiring experience for everyone too, because they no longer have to sweat about being like, gosh, what is Salesforce? I don't have it. I don't have the goods for Salesforce. So am I good enough for this job? Like those are things that, um, are 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 really important for folks as they as they start to look for new jobs, um, and I think the last one too. I'll, I'll get into. Um, I know I'm about time, um, but Hootsuite, and that's just an example of lots of other social media tools that do the planning for you. So all of you have to do is plug in your your credentials for any of your like social media sites, um, and. Uh, any of your social media sites, you plug in the credentials and you can put posts, plant them in there. And then Hootsuite takes care of the rest and posts those 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 uh, social media posts at the given time that you have determined. Um, so if it's at a specific time because you planned it out in your project management tool, you're able to, to do that and sit back and relax and not have to... Um, to worry about it or be like, yeah, I have to be at my computer at this time to press enter to post. Hootsuite takes care of it all for you. And there's lots of great tools out there that do similar types of work. Um, let's see here. Last resources that I have for you all um, are Tech Accelerate. N10 has a Tech Accelerate, it's free. 
it is a uh, an assessment tool that we have um, that asks some very broad questions um, and some specific questions as well to determine where you're at with like how you're interfacing with technology at your at your work and in your work environment too, and it gives you like a score, um, and also if you're like in an area of like you know tech funding and you're really struggling with figuring out how to like how do I fund tech, it gives you resources too. So if you have a low score in that area, you're able to find those resources and plug into a network where you can start to learn more about. Um, that area where maybe like the score needs to be bumped up a bit too. We've had a lot of really great success too. And I would encourage you all to do it. It's absolutely free and you get the results fairly, fairly quickly. And also like it takes, the only thing is it takes, I think around two hours. So dedicate some time for it. Um, and then la um, also it's the equity guide for nonprofit technology too. And I think this is really um, what I, I want to drive home for you all too, that people driven process and understanding that folks come first, their learning abilities, everyone's very different in how they receive information, how they tell information. And we as, um, we as folks who are leaders must be fluent in both too, and be able to be aware of folks um, who we're working with who may not be able to name it themselves. So this equity guide for nonprofit technology that we have too, and I can put the link in after I'm, I'm done talking, but um, it's, a, it's a really great starter point for you all um, if you're wanting to uh, start equity work and fold it into how you're, um, how, you're, how you're working with technology in your organization. It's a really great tool. It's an iterative uh, document and we're going to, um, we're going to be putting out another version of it fairly soon. So very excited for that. And then lastly, just hop over to n10.org too. And, um, you know, we're, we're happy to, to help you facilitate anything that you would need to. And also you can always contact me too. So <laughs> yeah, that's, that's all I have too. Um, very top level. But again, one thing I hope you all walk away from is, uh, is just centering the people in your process, not at the end of your, your um, tech journey, but along the way as well. Amazing. Thank you, Tristan. You're um, welcome. So it's been a great uh, conversation so far to, to talk about some tools and resources available. Um, now really delighted to learn from practitioners who are actually working with, uh, with some of these tools and, and even developing new tools um, to find out how digital tools have helped um, their projects improve their operations and increase their engagement. Um, so I'll ask our speakers to turn on your cameras and unmute um, yourselves. So it looks like the crew is here. Hi, everybody. Um, so um, what we can do just to, to start things off, um, you know, we do want this to be a, a conversation, but to start things off, let's go one by one, um, introduce yourselves um, and talk a bit um, about your projects. Um, so uh, Maggie is, is the first person I see on my screen. Would you like to, to start things off? Sure, sure. Um, I'll introduce myself. Uh, my name is Maggie Grayson. I'm a designer, futurist, and the lead researcher for Digital Creator North. Um, it's a uh, part of N2M2L. I'm gonna throw it over to Sharon, um, who's here, uh, who brought me in. Hi, thanks, Maggie. I'm Sharon Switzer. Uh, I work for the Near North Mobile Media Lab, which is an arts service organization that focuses on uh, media artists. Um, the project that I'm in charge of is called Digital Creator North. Uh, the project actually started before I came into the organization in, um, uh, and we're based in North Bay, so Northern Ontario. Uh, it started uh, in 2017. Um, it is a, it's a uh, project that uh, worked with six, originally six partners across Northern Ontario, mostly libraries. We created low barrier free um, sort of casual hangout spaces for youth and emerging artists to learn uh, digital media and explore their own creativity at their own pace. So there was a lot of hanging out. There was a lot of playing video games. There was a lot of working one-on-one -on -one with mentors, collaborating with each other. Um, really the space was based on a homago method uh, 
which um, was pioneered by U Media in Chicago. Hamago stands for hang out, mess around and geek out. So it really focused on the different ways that youth um, uh, interacted with digital media. Um, so we happily ran those six uh, in-person spaces in libraries and museums in Northern Ontario until COVID. Um, our current funding uh, from the Canada Council was a kind of three phase uh, project. So it just so happened that phase one ended around the time COVID hit. We, we had to reimagine phase two, which had been a growth phase. We pivoted to like most other organizations. Uh, we pivoted um, to look at online solutions. We realized that we didn't just want to go online and offer workshops, um, you know, Zoom sessions or YouTube videos. So we brought in Maggie to lead research for this project. Um, and our goal was really to, as much as possible, emulate the value uh, that we had found in our in-person spaces. So it was not about the technology, but was about the ethos of those spaces, the kids themselves, the fun they had, the ways they hung out, um, their sense of ownership over those spaces. So we had a, a very ambitious project of trying to figure out how to do that online. Um, and over this past year, we've sort of just closing out phase two. We did create an online space. Uh, we did try as much as we could to emulate uh, those values that we found in our physical spaces. Um, what we found was, and, and, and we can talk about this a little more, but what we found was we had lost the community that we had in those physical spaces. We had to rebuild community. The trust we had with those youth through the, our original partners, through the libraries, wasn't there. Um, so the, the youth weren't, you know, knocking on our virtual doors. They weren't bang, you know, showing up in the numbers we had expected. So we started reaching out to new partners and new, as well as our existing uh, community partners and working with them to try to reach their youth that uh, were in their communities and offering projects and events and workshops within our digital space. Uh, that worked to a certain degree. Uh, the partners were excited. Uh, we, uh, they liked what we were doing, but we still really had a hard time bringing the kids in. The kids who came in really enjoyed themselves, but maybe it's screen fatigue, um, not sure. We didn't have the numbers that we wanted. Um, despite being pretty proud of the space we created, uh, and so our next phase, we're actually, um, you know, in sync with COVID, we hope, uh, looking at reopening physical spaces, uh, incorporating the learnings that we had through the digital. Um, the digital uh, space allows us to reach people we can't with our physical space. We can uh, go outside of the cities, outside of the you know, immediate communities of those libraries or, or physical spaces. Um, but really going back to what we know, which is creating physical spaces that use technology um, in creative ways, but aren't actual like solely technology uh, and actually helping other communities to create what we've created. So uh, starting a network, and helping other organizations create these uh, digital creator spaces. So that's, in a nutshell, what we're up to these days. Super. Um, <laughs> thanks, Sharon. And, and a, lot, a lot of good stuff to, to continue to dig in there. Um, we, I'd love to invite the Indigenous Friends uh, team to, to introduce yourselves um, and, and your project. Perfect, Katie. Thank you. Uh, Plan, everyone. Akinkin uh, Wanikan Alejandro. Hello, my name is Alejandro. I'm the executive director and founder of Indigenous Friends Association. We are an Indigenous-led tech non-for-profit that works around indigeneity and digital technologies. 
So our center is digital technology and indigenous peoples, indigenous worldviews. So all our practice, all our, uh, that we do is around the digital. So a lot of the conversations that are happening right now actually makes sense a lot of to us. Uh, ironically, when, when Tristan was talking, we were laughing because actually we were on a Slack uh, on our Slack, like uh, texting each other uh, about, uh, you know, our process on Salesforce, our process on Hootsuite, our process uh, uh, on the different, even uh, around Asana. We also try Asana. We decided to go for ClickUp uh, because uh, a lot of the interface, as you said, is so important to listen to the people that are going to be using the tools. Uh, so I, I think we are very immersed in the space and, and we are encountering a lot of opportunities, but also a lot of challenges. And I think that is a little bit of what we want to share with everyone today. Um, uh, part of the programs that we do are on the educational side, uh, developing digital uh, skills for indigenous youth in Canada and how they can uh, you know, uh, pursue a, a tech career, maybe through post-secondary education or, or through employment. But also we are trying to develop digital tools that are more ethical. And how we are doing that is incorporating traditional knowledge as part of the, of the software process. So it's not just a cultural component, it's part of the ethics that we need to incorporate in digital technologies. So this is, uh, you know, encountering some challenges that we will explain a little bit later. But also, I think there is a lot of a space that we all can contribute. Um, I'm going to then pass uh, 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 the turn to Alina. Alina, maybe you can talk a little bit of one of uh, our projects in Digi, in Digi Health and a little bit of what we have been doing with, with the funds that we received last year. Thank you. Um, yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Alina, um, and I'm the tech lead at uh, Indigenous Friends. So uh, we do have a couple of projects. We have... Um, the Indige Friends app and then the Indige Health app. So I'll be talking a little bit about the Indige Health app. Um, so essentially, uh, we started, uh, we created this app um, or platform, I should say, um, because of uh, COVID, and we wanted to create a space that uh, provided reliable resources, um, specifically for Indigenous people in Ontario. Um, to uh, to get information from about you know uh, updates regarding COVID, how to get vaccinated, how to um, find clinics to get tested, and things like that. Um, and so uh, as as things have evolved with uh, COVID, we've realized that um, you know we need to turn the space into. Um, something that can actually target the mental, the physical, the spiritual, and the emotional side of things. Um, so, so yeah, and, and we try to provide um, announcements and, uh, you know, all the latest information um, uh, about, about COVID and, and uh, really anything to do with the um, specifically health resources related to indigeneity that you can find in Toronto. Um, yeah, uh, Mackenzie, would you like to go next? Ani, bojo, Mackenzie, dijna kas, gumlik, anishinaabek. So my name is Mackenzie Toulouse and I reside from Sigma Anishinaabek. I've been with Indigenous Friends uh, since April 2016, but I'm the Indigenous Educator in Recruitment and Partnerships. So what my role is that came into this uh, project that we're speaking about Indigenous health is I'm the anti-bot. So I'm a virtual Indigenous anti that helps navigate our Indigenous youth on our website. So one of the things that, um, that I come here with is experience because I lived in my First Nation for 32 years and Indigenous ways of knowing and learning was my way of um, how I grasp my learning. So when I went into um, mainstream learning and Western learning, I had a really hard time. So that's just a common experience that we have in Indigenous people when we come into mainstream and Western learning or even non-Indigenous spaces. So one of the other things is virtual spaces, right? So we uh, experience all these, you know, not so fun things that we all have uh, experienced once in our lives. So right now, um, my job is to be that auntie that gives you 
um, a safe, welcoming space that says, hi, how are you today? Um, have you had some water? Water is really important. Water has the ability to heal. And instead of, um, like we try to give them uh, both options of Western, uh, different resources of Western medicines, um, organizations in indigenous urban settings, but also to always uh, put our culture first. So we give a teaching, for example, if you want to pick cedar for cedar tea, and he will tell you, remember to always give tobacco before we take from the land, we are after they offer tobacco. So at the same time, you're getting a teaching when you're looking for a resource. And sometimes our people just need that extra, um, that extra um, inspiration, you know, that comfort, that support. So that's my role that I play in Kitchen to Help. So what we do there is also we look at different approaches, the holistic approach. So when you think about the medicine wheel, we think about the physical, mental, spiritual, emotional. And when you pick um, a mental the sector, you're going to find different kinds of things that have um, mental health, um, maybe um, organizations, Indigenous uh, mental health workers within Toronto. So at the same time, we're trying to um, give them those resources. But we also have humor because Indigenous people are very humorous people. So at the same time, that's a ability that goes to show that we have a capability of heal, right? So at the same time, Auntie tries to keep, you know, your spirits high and actually tries to help you navigate and always reminds you that, you know, the land is really important. You need to take a break on the land. So this is one of the roles that I play in this project. So one of the things that I come to see during COVID is um, because I live in my first nation is there's a lot of um, substance abuse issues, a lot of mental health, a lot of uh, depression. And there was a lot of deaths due to overdosing crisis during COVID. So at the same time, like this is something that I see. So I, I was able to think about, well, okay, so what does my people need that I would need if I was there, right? So this is the, I come with the experiences and I always try to relate it as what did I need when I was vulnerable? Because I was in Toronto and I was a high risk um, university student for six years. So at the same time, I come with that. So I, I would just like to say that, um, big important thing is that Indigenous ways of knowing is an alternative way of how we adapt and how we learn. So um, at the same time, like no learning is better than another, but we just try to give it two options to recognize that our people need that safe space. Miigwech. Uh, and and just, just to close the circle and to end in a circle in an Indigenous pedagogy, uh, and uh, I think uh, the example that Mackenzie just explained about artificial intelligence, and how to create an antibot that I responds uh, because Mackenzie is not all the, all the time uh, responding. It's like a bot that we created uh, with IBB, IBM Watson uh, that is our artificial intelligence tool to actually create this antibot that is uh, culturally appropriate for any participant that comes into the space, the digital space. Um, and, I, and we don't want to take the space, but one thing that we really want to share is that even that these tools are great and we are trying to use these digital tools, I think we need more people to really get activated and be open about it. We are facing a lot of challenges when we are proposing a lot of the projects. When we go with the big companies and we start talking about indigenous ways of knowing, there is a lot of clashback. There is a lot of, uh, of resistance, a, a lot of no, 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 no. Things are not doing in that way, how you are going to do it. Just very, very briefly, and I, pro I promise it's going to take one minute. Uh, Alina, do, do you want to share a little bit of the challenges that we had with uh, Indigenous Health, uh, with the big, big tech, co tech companies? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so when uh, we created the platforms, both of them, Indigenous Friends and Indigenous Health, uh, we obviously wanted to make them available to as many people as possible. So we had a web platform as uh, and we also wanted to publish the platforms on uh, the App Store for Apple and the Google Play Store as well. Um, and so what happened basically is uh, when we tried to uh, publish uh, Indigenous Indigi Health uh, into the uh, stores, Google was like, yeah, that's fine. You know, your app is available now. Um, and Apple had a big issue with it. They actually said uh, that our app was not enough of an app to be uh, featured in stores um, and that it was uh, very limited. It wasn't sufficient enough. 
Um, and we followed up with them many times. We appealed many times. We changed some things many times and they continued to reject us every single time. So it was a big, big issue. Um, and as a result, we've, uh, we just had to change everything entirely. We've had to change the plan entirely. It took months for us to try to convince Apple to let us have the app in stores, but, um, yeah, we were just not allowed to. Yeah. Rebecca, <laughs> um, and then um, also, uh, just uh, as a side note, uh, for our Indigo Friends app, uh, in the description of the app that we put out in the stores, we initially used to have um, greetings that were welcoming greetings in many different indigenous languages. Um, so this was starting from version one that we had these greetings. When we released version three, suddenly we got completely rejected from Google. Um, they said that you we don't allow um, inappropriate language. We don't allow uh, languages that are not specifically in English that don't make sense, that are irrelevant. Um, and uh, specifically, you're not allowed to have this first line of, you know, indigenous languages uh, because that doesn't follow our rules that we have. So after we tried to speak to them multiple times, they just gave us, they only let us speak to a bot instead of a real human being. Um, again, we got rejected and uh, we just had to take those lines of uh, welcoming greetings uh, completely out to be allowed into stores again. Um, so yeah, those were some of the biggest challenges that we, that we, uh, that we faced. Yes, absolutely. Apple and Google really need some training. Um, yeah, and um, Mackenzie, I think, uh, I'm so sorry, actually. Uh, I think we talked about you covering something as well. Yeah, I, I think uh, like she already covered the antibody. Oh, yes, and, yes, and, sorry, and, yeah. Yeah, no, 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 and especially because I know where the, uh, we have a, a line uh, time limitation. Uh, we don't want to take more space, but I really wanted to share this as an example of the challenges and opportunities that we have in the space. Great, yeah, really, really appreciate all of this. And, and certainly something we're thinking and talking a lot about at the, the Canadian Center for Nonprofit Digital Resilience is, is not just how nonprofits can use technology tools better, um, but how can we and our communities come together and really, you know, advocate for the kinds of technology futures we want to see? Um, so whether that's, you know, building alternatives to what's being offered by big tech, whether that's engaging in sort of policy and regulatory discussions that, that are happening, like putting ethical guardrails on AI, you know, I think there's a huge opportunity for, for those of us who have our feet on the ground in in community um, to, to, you know, bring, bring that awareness and, and knowledge to these conversations. So really looking forward to, to curating more of, more of those conversations. Um, so, uh, you know, I think what's come out quite a bit, a lot, a lot has come out, uh, but certainly everyone, you know, is, is grappling, grappling with this interplay between the digital world and the physical world, um, and would love to hear from both organizations. You know how how do you see this relationship between digital and and physical um, when it comes to place making um, specifically? And and I know we've we've touched on this a little bit, but would love to hear any any further thoughts. Okay, how about? I mean, I guess I yeah, can yeah. speak sure. briefly to that. Sure. Uh, we definitely found that it was not a one-to-one -one relationship. Yeah. We thought that we could, you know, take the values uh, that we had in our physical space and create them in the, a virtual space and it would work. Uh, and in many ways, lots of things did work about that space. And I'd like to, uh, in a second, talk about tools as well, because we, um, I, I, we have some some things we'd like to share about that. But in terms of the relationship, um, the social interactions online are different than they are in physical space. People relate to each other differently. So we thought, oh, kids love to be in a virtual space. They love to be online. They'll just take to this like water. But what we found was um, that when they're not together, when they're separated, and in their own homes or their own spaces, they actually relate to each other, uh, at least in our space, differently than they do um, when they were all together sitting in a virtual, uh, a physical space and could uh, 
create those relationships in a kind of different, um, a different time frame, dif different, just a different manner. Um, so what we ended up finding, um, and perhaps it was for us that, that we just didn't have the time to build up that space. We don't have the capacity, um, but we found that what the kids liked most in a physical space wasn't a workshop. It was the learning at their own pace, learning with each other, um, the kind of more hanging out casual uh, opportunities. Uh, but we didn't have the, um, although we had those opportunities for them within our virtual space. Um, and I could share, I mean, I could show screen grabs or put them in the text, but um, what we, maybe I will, can I share my screen? Is that possible? It says I can. Hold on. Uh, here. So can everyone see that? So this is an example of our, our virtual space in Gathertown that we created. Um, so here's our collaboration room. Here are all the various software that we found uh, that allowed kids to play together and collaborate together. Um, and, we, and we also had another space uh, that had all our workshops. But what we found was when we invited kids in, we were inviting them for specific workshops without having that ability for them to, to play. Part of that was that um, was a security issue. We only had the space open when we could supervise it. So kids couldn't come any time, day or night and create their own community. Um, and that limited I think the relationships that could be formed and even the, the time that they had to explore what we had to offer. I think um, I'm going to leave it at that. Um, I'd, I'd love to add something to that as well in that um, the physical spaces had foot traffic and people could kind of, you know, see what was going on without engaging with it. However, mm, yeah. when we had the digital space, it was either you're in or you're out. There, there isn't kind of a, um, you know, 3000 foot um, view and like, you know, um, name on the building that says library, which has expectations built up around it. Um, we, you know, we kind of um, by, by nature of digital, we had collapsed that down to a URL um, and then you're in. So um, that's a huge difference in um, um, the way that we could act, interact and create opportunities for interaction with people who um, you know, aren't casually strolling by anymore. Great. Yeah, thank you, Maggie. Uh, one th one thing that uh, we found really fascinating about the connection between the digital and the physical space, especially talking about indigenous worldviews, is the connection with the land. We have very important conversations with elders and knowledge keeper. Has, how important it was to have that physicality with the land? So we can have a great space, we can have a virtual space, but it's so important to go back to the land. So how that become a conversation or how we transform our sessions is now part of, part of any workshop that we do is we send physical medicines to the people that are connected to the, to the workshops. So actually they can have that physical aspect of the medicines and physical aspect of going out of the, of the virtual and continue their journey outside. And also it was so important to uh, recognize that the digital space is not gonna heal the process of the youth. It's just gonna be the triggering. It's the, the, the physical aspect is still required, right? So it, it, it's really interesting when you start seeing these connections and also, also the opportunities because what we found is indigenous peoples across Canada were connecting to a ceremony just to have that like moment and they were like, even we don't need the medicine. We have the medicine here. We just need to listen to the teachings, right? And we are we can do that on Zoom. And, and it was really important to engage in that part. So 
I, I think there is a very interesting process about embodiment uh, and, and land that is so important in the connections between the physical and the digital. I'd also like to add that uh, one of the features that we wanted to include in our app, the Indigenous Friends app, is uh, medicines uh, and collectibles. So sort of something that gamified our app a little bit to excite people. So under collectibles, we had things like ribbon skirts and uh, oh. copper cups and copper bowls and things like that that got people really excited. But what we also wanted to do was um, have medicine so that people could offer medicine for someone or you know, ask someone to offer medicine for them. Um, but when we presented this idea to um, Elder Blue Waters, um, they mentioned like, you can't do this only virtually, there has to be a physical aspect to it. You have to, you know, do it in a physical way too. So the way that that transformed was that anytime someone does offer medicine or a request to offer medicine, yes, they do it virtually, but they also do it physically in uh, in real life as well. So multiple times, uh, you know, I've I've received medicines from other people. That means that they are actually in real life offering those medicines for me. Um, and yeah, this like back and forth works really well. Great. Um, so I'm I'm cognizant of time, and we do have a few more minutes. But I think it would be helpful to to talk a little bit about the tools. So, you know, it, it would be interesting to hear the ways in which digital tools are helping each of your organizations achieve your goals. Um, and also just advice um, that you would have for other projects or other organizations um, that are interested in using um, digital tools more actively for, for placemaking or community building. Um, Sharon, do you want to? Yep. Yeah. Yep, sure. <laughs> a couple of things. Um, so when we were originally in our in-person spaces, we uh, we were focusing on like Adobe Suite. We could afford to have the Adobe Suite in our physical space. Kids could come in. They were able to uh, use and learn that uh, software, even if they couldn't afford to do it at home or didn't have it at their own school or whatever. So that we felt like that was an important uh, thing to offer them. When we went online, it became a completely different thing. Our goal to create uh, and to maintain that kind of low barrier access uh, to technology as much as we could actually had us searching completely other things. Our goal became open source, free, web-based, so that the kids could, if they were playing in our space, they could play on their own computers without having to afford the the software or download anything, everything was, you know, um, the kind of lowest possible threshold for accessing the technology. Um, our other goal was um, to find online software that was collaborative, which we hadn't actually been thinking about before because kids could collaborate together in physical space. Now, if we wanted them to collaborate, we had to find software that allowed them to paint together or make music together, even if they were in physically different spaces. Um, and all of that, you know, we wanted to, it to be free and easy. Um, so we did find a bunch of those tools um, and just moving into that virtual space kind of helped focus uh, our goals and what we were looking for in terms of technology. So one thing I wanted to add too, which can be a barrier for, for folks too, and I know I've encountered this barrier um, in working in nonprofit has been um, when we get funding and we get like a grant too, there's oftentimes like no line in that budget for any sort of like technological piece of equipment, <laughs> software, hardware, whatever it is to help really grow that program too. And that's been such a struggle for me too. And I think that's why what's what's drawn me back to where I currently in my, my role and my passion, what I do at N10 is um, just the idea that like, that should be on equal footing with like, you know, any other program expense that you have too. It shouldn't be lumped in with like office paper or coffee filters, you know? And, and I think that's really hard um, and it was very frustrating as someone who didn't really have a lot of power as a person of color in white dominant organizations to 
to be able to say, no, we need money for this tool. We need not only money for this tool, but we need continuity for this tool. And so with that continuity piece, it's like, um, <laughs> there are a lot of organizations or funders or, you know, anyone who was giving us money that was like, here's the, here's this cool tool that we got. We expect you to take it. No questions asked. And now we're not going to help you with any training, any professional development along the way too. And I think that's something that's really been um, a barrier for folks up until now. Um, and it's exciting in this COVID time to also, you know, see funders and philanthropy <laughs> relax a bit in in terms of funding and how they give it to organizations too not all not across the board lord i would love to make that a blank rule and make every single grant that we've applied for um unrestricted um and that would be great but that's just not the case but there's movement in that direction too which frees up a lot of dollars to be able to allocate that to the continuity of whatever tool um that you're using in the digital space Oh, Tristan, uh, I, I think I would really want to talk about this one. Uh, I, we have been like pushing and pushing to get money for this. And what we are telling all our funders, this is like buying paper for the printer. Like we need this if we want to deliver the program. So yes. actually in the line of supplies is like mm -hmm. cloud services and everything, Slack, uh, Zoom, uh, mm -hmm. you know, all these different tools. Mm -hmm. and, and also uh, an experience that we have uh, talking about uh, finding funds and it's very applicable for a lot of the people here. Uh, in Ontario, for example, there was the Ontario Resilient Fund mm -hmm. to create resilience after COVID. And what we apply for is like for a training for Salesforce and actually to tailor Salesforce for the needs of the organization. Mm -hmm. but it, I, that was part of the, if you want to create resilience within the organization, we need this tool because this is a reporting tool. I don't want to get into the details of Salesforce, but I think this is part of what we are finding that there is a change, especially after the pandemic. Yeah. And, and, and you can find more windows to find actually funds that actually are attached to grants. So mm. it's, it's something that it can be like uh, sustainable in the long term. Um, something that I also I want to point out and talking about strategies is all these platforms commonly they have a non-for-profit discounts. So always, even if they, if they are not public in their websites, just send an email to the sales representative and ask for the non-for-profit discount. It's uh, like most of them, they even they have 50 to 100% discount for non-for-profits. And so that can actually decrease a lot of the, of the price. The, the, the third strategy that I would say is important that they are mobile friendly because in, this, in many contexts, especially in marginalized communities, it's not always possible to have a laptop. So sometimes something that is tablet uh, uh, friendly that you can use in the mobile is important. Um, uh, and fourth and the last one that I would say it was very important for us is try to find a champion within your organization uh, that actually can, that can help you to get into all these technologies. I, I think new, uh, the uh, new generations are very used to use these tools and they are getting really fast in, it's just something internal that they already know just, just uh, by, by default. So um, just allowing them and providing the tools institutionally to actually teach others how to use these tools can be very useful. So it's not about uh, spending thousands and thousands of dollars in getting this very specific and technical training. It's just creating those champions within your organization that commonly are going to be uh, young, that are like, you know, uh, that, that they are part of this uh, digital generation. And I think that can be a way to start uh, implementing these strategies. Fantastic. Um... I think it, unless anybody has any last thoughts they want to share, I think it'd be great to, to go over to Q&A because there may be some uh, some folks who would like to ask pan questions of the panel. Uh, but any any last thoughts before we, we hop over there? Okay, I will toss it back to Naomi then. Amazing. Thank you so much to everyone. That was just just amazing to get to hear um added so many layers i think to this conversation that are that are really important and and i think it's just a start to a conversation that a lot 
a lot of us need to be having. Um, I just have a couple, a couple of questions to sort of ask on a last note um, from the audience. So I'm going to go to the first one, which I think, I think for, I think for both organizations, um, just, just two, two minutes, maybe just how did you go about developing your platforms? Like, what did that process actually look like, you know, especially in terms of advice for like smaller charities that might need to um, be building sort of hybrid platforms? Um, yeah, please, e either. I would, if, if our organization is going to talk, I would throw it over to Maggie as our lead researcher. She took us through that process of developing. Um, thanks, Sharon. Uh, so, um, two fantastic researchers um, spent a lot of time looking at what um, what platforms there are out there to try to replicate again the ethos of the homago, uh, hanging out, messing around, and geeking out um, ethos that we had in the physical space. So, with a lot of those design principles, we took that into online and looked at a lot of um, metaverse tools and um, um, things like Minecraft education and looking for the, um, the feel of what it might be like to, to go into this playful space. And we ended up picking Gather Town, which is an emerging um, sort of 8-bit pixel um, space where you're kind of looking at it um, um, almost top down. Sharon had some um, maps of that earlier. And um, one of the things that we learned about Gather Town was that it was constantly updating its, um, itself and how to use it and everything. So um, a, a huge part of Rebecca and Tyler's time was actually spent getting to know um, the platform and um, how they, they opened up options and, and shifted permissions and stuff like that throughout the course of the, the year. So I think it takes a resource for sure to understand and dig into um, what platform you're using. And uh, it's not a small task. Thank you. And I don't know where. And one from the other indigenous friend wants to speak. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Alina, uh, the tech lead, yeah. I think this is the best person. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, there was a lot of research that went into creating our platforms. Um, so one thing was that, you know, we, we wanted to make the platform um, as secure and private as possible. We didn't want to share any of our users' information with anyone. Um, and so because of that, we tried to get we tried to find a back end a database that was local and uh, not hosted by uh, GAFAM at all. Um, that's uh, Google, Amazon, Facebook, Apple, and Microsoft. Um, and uh, so we did discover one of them and um, it's, it's been a whole process. We, what, I, what I'll say is we need more. <laughs> um, and um, aside from that, what we also wanted what we also discovered along the way basically is this new way of developing apps uh, that has worked really well for us. Um, and um, I, I think that if, if, we, uh, if we want to create uh, platforms that are a little bit more inclusive and um, more understanding of the different kinds of people that exist and think and look different as well, um, then uh, this is sort of the way to go. It's a it's a four phase um, development method. So it goes over you know all the all the phases that someone would need to build a platform, um, and it includes a lot of uh, conversation, a lot of sharing circles rather than focus groups, um, a lot of uh, very iterative um, ways of going about developing. Uh, a platform. Um, yeah, I, I think that in order to create technology that works for us, we need to be the ones that, to, that are creating it. We need to have conversations with people that look like us as well. Otherwise, we're going to keep getting rejected from big names like Apple and Google. Um, so yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I was going to follow up on that question, actually, with one specifically about 
sort of challenging the the sort of app structure, sort of how, you know, wondering if, if the panelists have any more to add about how how that process of change might might start to be initiated. I mean, I think we've heard lots of ideas and pieces, um, but if anyone had any last thoughts thoughts about that they wanted to share, please. If may I jump in this one? Uh, and, and this is part of the passion and, and why we're doing what we are doing. Uh, I, I think part of what we really want is to go beyond the digital divide, that discourse about just providing access to communities. Because providing access is crea creating a dependency with the communities. What about if you provide control and ownership of the technology and you start uh, developing skills in the people that are going to be using the technology? So provide that resiliency, that uh, like that capacity locally, so communities can take over the technology. And I think this is where that's why I, I'm very passionate about uh, the, the work that Katie is leading. Is I think local communities and and a lot of the civil society needs to take over and start creating technology that is working for people. And it can be this technology can be more ethical can be instead of being focusing on creating more capital, we can focus on people in creating better communities. And I think that is the, for the first point, the, the starting point. Can I speak to that for a minute? Please, please Sharon. So uh, a, a lot of what we spent our uh, Healthy Community uh, Foundation uh, grant on was a community liaison. And that, uh, that, that uh, woman is taking us through um, a process of, of slowly uh, building up relationships with communities um, who we didn't originally have relationships with and trying to understand their needs um, so that we can, uh, around technology, um, so that we can uh, help them understand the ways in which we can help them um, and work with them and also to, uh, so that when we're when we're looking for partners to create these digital creator spaces, we're not going to all the you know uh, the the kinds of organizations we already know, right? So it's not just the libraries, but it's other sorts of organizations and community groups who might not even understand the value uh, of a of an organization like this. So um, or a, or a project like this. So we're trying to. Um, put people first and give them not just access, but like tools to control and create their own spaces where they can do whatever they want with those spaces and learn within those spaces in their own ways. So that's been a real uh, kind of shift for us in a, in a really positive way. Um, our learnings. Can I add on that too? Um, I think one thing that's been really enlightening too is I hear everyone uh, talking about their own process too and really um, centering the folks. It's really great too. And also like, as it's very exciting to to hear like an indigenous led organization as an indigenous person, I'm half Navajo and half black. And like to hear like that work going on elsewhere and like, you know, asynchronously too. And I, I really like the, the rising tides lifts all ships type of metaphor for this too. And what's what what I think too, and what um, both what Alejandro and also Sharon were, were speaking to and what, what resonated most with me was um, the idea that, you know, centering folks and making them owning the process or owning the, 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 P, the actual piece of software, like you have ownership in this too. And also, like I was saying before, bringing them along the ride when you're testing it out too. So where are those nooks and crannies where you're like, and we're struggling to figure out which app is this? We're in testing mode too, bringing in folks from the community to test that out in real time, to challenge the user experience, to flow with the user experience, to give very honest and raw feedback about that, that is going to not only just be like heard, but also digested and manifested in a newer version and more equitable version of whatever tool you're using. And I, I think that's the thing that I was really mind blowing for me. It's a very basic concept, but I hadn't really, I didn't really understand that because I had never been like baptized in it in previous um, nonprofit work where I had been asked my opinion about a process. I had always shown up to a meeting and been like, this is the new um, software we're using. Y'all need to deal with it or get out. 
And there was no, and it impacted my work very directly too. So I love this idea of what Alejandro is talking about and also what Sharon has like identified as like the ownership of like folks who are going to be working with the um, like, you know, your, the folks that you're serving, but also the folks that are within the organization that their work is directly impacted by this piece of software too. Having them be a part of the process and the feedback process is invaluable. It's amazing, and it's, it's it's again, it's a it's a great conversation. That's like again, it, it's just started. I think I think, but um, some really important stuff to take away. Um, now, I have I have one last question. I think it's a, it's a bit more probably a Katie and Tristan directed one. Um, for any for any projects that are looking to sort of seek out further funding for technology or for supports for that, do you, you know are there any sort of final resources you would you would have to recommend? We're all you know we'll also send along every resource from today. Yeah. Uh, in a follow-up email uh, to everyone. And, and then after that, I'm, I'm happy to close things out. I mean, as I like chew on this, um, I there are places, and I don't know them off the top of my head, and I'd have to reach out to uh, my boss, Amy Sample Ward. Um, they're the CEO of N10, and they're super knowledgeable about all like the philanthropy and funding pieces. But one thing I will say too is when you're, um, there's like this, this view uh, in, in nonprofit too, there are larger organizations like what you were talking about, um, Sharon, like the usual set of like community resources that you go to, they have the capacity to, to have a development person to dedicate full time to. And I think a lot of times we lose sight of is um, a lot of the grassroots, smaller organizations that are like four folks just getting together, they don't have the capacity to have a dedicated development person. Um, so they're having to rely on the free tools um, sad to say Facebook, but Facebook is a good thing for those smaller organizations that just need their word out too. And it's, it sucks because I hate Facebook. Um, but like it serves a purpose for those smaller grassroots organizations that need some piece of technology and don't have the funding to do it. So it's, it's like a straddling of the fence to understand what is actually really going on with those smaller grassroots oftentimes black and indigenous led organizations that are like just trying to like get the word out on their work, but don't have the capacity to do so. And so I think there's that piece. And I also um, want to talk about real quickly about like the funding piece of uh, understanding that uh, with funding um, and also like the procuring of the software is you are in the driver's seat 100% of the time when you are testing out or demoing any sort of piece of software that you have. And don't forget it ever. Um, because I, it's similar to, you know, when you're buying a car, it's like, wow, the salesman is so pushy. Um, and and so I, I think that was a, a new epiphany that I had was I'm in the driver's seat and I can absolutely be like, no, that's not good enough for me. And um, to have that type of autonomy and power in that situation and also similar adjacent to that like process is asking for references from those people. If they're selling what they're selling and they're professing that it's the best thing, they should have references. They should have other nonprofit references with which for you to reach out to and say, hey, how is this working for you and how have you implemented it within your own tech infrastructure? And I think lastly, um, to answer that question on the funding side too, is create when you are writing those grants that aren't specifically geared towards the tech pieces, being explicit, saying, okay, cool, let's treat tech as its own bucket. And what do we need to maintain it along the way? So it's a, yes, there are, there's funding out there that specifically targets like the digital inclusion piece, but there's also wiggle room within, again, throwback to our own autonomy and we own the funding and where we are and where we stand with things, but also lining it out in that budget for a grant that may not be identifying tech as a thing and seeing if they take the bait. So just uh, just a couple of quick quick points to add to that and interest, and I hundred percent agree with you on on all of that. Um, so yeah, not gonna lie, there is not <laughs> there's not some secret bucket of of dedicated tech funding um, ready for the taking. But I think you know, agree with Tristan, um, we have to ask, um, and part of that is building the tech awareness of your funders. So just hammering home technology is not overhead. Period. It's a program cost. It needs to be funded. Um, 
you know, another piece is, is working together. Um, why is every nonprofit organization building its own data strategy? We all know data strategies are important. We don't all need our own. Um, a lot of us are doing similar things, seeking similar outcomes. If, you know, if groups that are either working in the same area, geographic area, um, topic, you know, could come together and say, this is what we need to build together. That's a, you know, a more compelling ask to, uh, to funders and can be a lot more sort of resource um, efficient. One, you know, I'm really sort of not a huge booster of um, corporate volunteerism, um, but I think there is some interesting work happening in sort of civic tech communities um, and building bridges to them, I think can be quite um, helpful. And that's actually another event we're, we're planning um, to talk about how civic tech communities can help nonprofits. Um, and, you know, as, as it was mentioned in the chat, I think, you know, a subsector by subsector approach is probably what's happening. So we're seeing, you know, there is something specific for, for arts organizations right now. I think that's where we've seen it as well with, with settlement organizations and that sort of thing. Um, but the last thing I'd say, and, you know, I, I will make a plug for, for N10's um, Tech Accelerate tool, um, which is their um, assessment. A lot of organizations use that, take the assessment, and then that's something that you can take to your funders and say, we did the assessment, this is where we stand, this is where we have a huge gap. Um, and then and then that makes, a, that helps sort of boost the ask and make it a bit more compelling. Amazing, amazing. Um, thank you so much for that. Um, Alejandro, I know you wanna speak and sort of give a comment. I, I don't know if you wanted to, no, good, okay, great. Um, just wanted to check in. Um, that's amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone, for for the participation, for for the comments, for the for the passion. Um, I think I think one thing that's common here is that, uh, aside from the tech, is that that every single one of you seems to express such passion about the work that you're doing, and that that is also such a part of this work. Um, so again, thank you everyone for attending. We, we are running out of time. Um, thank you, Katie and Tristan, for hosting such a wonderful session, um, and to Alejandro, Alina, Mackenzie, Sharon, and Maggie. Uh, thank you so much for the important insights and as well for sharing your experiences so opening uh, openly. Um, and with the, the uh, purpose of continuing to learn and improve um, these sessions, we would really value if those in attendance could respond to a, a short feedback survey as a follow-up to this session. Uh, we will share it in the chat as well as send it out to you um, after this session, along with the recordings in both French and English. Um, we also, yeah. And so we hope you enjoyed the session. Uh, keep an eye on your emails for those follow-ups. And if there were any questions that were unanswered, we'll do all our best to get, to get uh, those questions answered for you. And so thank you so much again. We'll see you at our next mob session and, and see you soon. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks everyone.